Between 1918 and 1919, there was an active serial killer in New Orleans, and to this day, his identity remains a secret. This killer's victims were usually Italian immigrants who lived in New Orleans, which in the 1900s was the largest Italian community in the South. In most of the crime scenes, he would enter by chiseling small holes and he would use the victim's axe to kill them whilst they were asleep. No robbery ever occurred and with his victimology, it could be safe to assume that these were racially motivated kills. During the night, the axeman attacked Italian grocery stores and the families that lived in them. The victim profile led to many suspecting the Mafia in these killings. New Orleans Superintendent Frank Mooney said that the murderer was a quote, murderous degenerate who gloats over blood. Joseph and Catherine Maggio. The couple owned a grocery shop and were attacked whilst they were sleeping. The X-Men cut the throats with a razor and bashed her heads in with an axe. Catherine died instantly, but Joseph only died minutes after his brothers found him. The Axeman had apparently changed into fresh clothes as his bloody clothes were found in their apartment. The razor used on the couple also belonged to the family's barber shop. The two brothers, Jake and Andrew Maggio, found the dead couple two and a half hours after the attacks. Since Andrew only lived next door and somehow failed to hear the murders, he was the police chief's prime suspect. However, he was shortly released after. Louis Bazuma and Harriet Lower. The couple again owned a grocery store and Louis was hit with a hatchet on his head and Harriet was hit on the left ear. The axe used was Louis and was left behind in the bathroom. Their bashed bodies were found early the next morning by a delivery man, but they hadn't died. When the police were searching their house for clues, they found German, Russian and Yiddish letters in a trunk and were led to believe that Louis was a German spy, something which Harriet had believed too. Louis was immediately arrested and released two days later. Two of the lead investigators were demoted as they were providing, quote, unacceptable police work. In August 1918, he was arrested one more time as Harriet kept saying repeatedly that it was Louis who had attacked her. He served nine months in prison before being acquitted by a jury who made their decision in 10 minutes. It also turned out that Harriet was actually Louis's mistress and his actual wife was in Cincinnati, Anna Schneider. On August 5th, 1918, her husband came back from work and discovered his eight month pregnant wife. She was bashed in the face repeatedly. Two days after the attack, she gave birth to a healthy girl and claimed she remembered nothing from the attack. Since nothing was stolen and she claimed she didn't remember the attack, the police concluded that she had been attacked by a lamp which was on her bedside table. Joseph Romano, he was attacked on August 10th by a blow to the head. His two nieces heard strange sounds coming from his room and found him bleeding from two open cuts on his face. As they arrived, they saw the axe men leaving the scene and described him as, quote, dark skinned, heavy set man with a dark suit and a slouched hat. Yet again, the axe was found in the backyard and belonged to Joseph. Joseph died two days later due to severe head trauma. At this point in the attacks, John D'Antonio, a retired Italian detective, had told the public that he believed the killer to be an individual with dual personality, very much like Jekyll and Hyde. He also tried to link the Axeman to several murders which were committed years ago in 1911. Charles and Rosie Cortemiglia. Their neighbor, Giordano, heard screams coming from their apartment on March 10th and so went to help. Upon his arrival, he noticed that they all had been attacked Rosie was holding her daughter and Charles lay on the floor. They both had skull fractures. Again, nothing was stolen, but an axe was found at the back of the house. After Rosie awoke, she told the police that it was Giordano and his son, Frank, who had attacked them. Giordano, who was a neighbor who found the couple, was a 69-year-old man and too fragile to have committed the crimes, and Frank was too large to fit through the back door. Charles denied and disputed all these claims, but the police still arrested the two and they were found guilty. Frank was sentenced to hang and his father was to spend his life in prison. After the trial, Charles divorced Rosie and she later confessed that she had falsely accused the men due to jealousy and spite. They were released shortly after. I get that he's a serial killer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are surviving these attacks. That, you know what, that gives me, I've got a theory of why they're surviving. I think that this serial killer, he's like, 
he's having an episode or, you know, maybe he's got multiple personalities. And when it's happening, when he is killing these people, he's not so fixated on killing them. It's just more about attacking them. With the axe. And with the axe. Then he leaves. Maybe he even thinks they're dead. But that's why they're recovering. Maybe he's just one-shotting them. Yeah, like just hitting them once and and they're surviving. Interestingly, all these axes belong to the victims. Mm. So they're either found in the backyard, in the house somewhere. Weird. If this was going around, would you not just be like, right, just getting rid of all the axes in my house and I should be safe here? Yeah, I mean, after the first couple of times you're hearing about this, I'd, I wouldn't be owning an axe. If I need to cut down a tree, fuck it, I'll use a knife. <laughs> it's true. My question is, though, why does he use their axe? And is he picking his victims based like is he like looking in their house going okay they've got an axe right i can kill that family but like, how does he even know that they have an axe in their house i don't know maybe he like ha- gives him some sort of power feeling or something using their own their axe own against axe. them yeah. like they, they are the reason for their own death i don't know it just or, or maybe weird. just trying to save money buying your own axe and all back in the day could have been it could be it could actually be like an evidence thing if you were using the same axe over and over that, set you back a few shillings Of course, helping keep the lights on are our good friends over at BetterHelp. They're sponsoring this episode. And if you don't know what BetterHelp is, it is therapy. Now, therapy is one of the most underrated things you will ever, ever do. I'm telling you guys, uh, most of the people that uh, are on the internet, the people that you watch, even on TV, they all have some form of therapy. Now, the good thing is BetterHelp is there to help you guys. What they do is they have you answer out a few questions and match you with a professional therapist, someone that they think will fit and suit your needs, what you're after. And a lot of the time people think, oh, therapy, this is something, you know, this is if you have, you know, serious problems or you're, you're, you're really down bad, whatever it is. Um, but in actual fact, it can just be, you know, life can be pretty stressful as it is. And it's just about having someone to talk to, someone that doesn't judge you. Uh, and, and I think that's really important. And I know me and Chip, both massive fans of it. so. Um, if BetterHelp is something that you guys are interested in, at least go ahead and take a look at it. Um, it is really great. Um, and it's also one of those things that you guys can just do whenever as well. You know, you don't have to go in person. That can often be quite a daunting thing. This is done remotely as well, which is obviously a massive help. So if this is uh, something you guys are interested in, then check it, check out betterhelp.com slash fellas mysteries for 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com forward slash fellas mysteries. 10% off your first month. Come on, guys. We sorted you out. On March 13th, 1919, the X-Man wrote a letter which was published in the newspapers where he said he would kill again at quarter past midnight on March 19th, but would spare the people who would play live jazz music by a jazz band. On that night, all of New Orleans dance halls and bars were filled and there were hundreds of parties around the town and no one was killed on that night. Now, to be exact, at 12.15, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the never regions that every person shall be spared, in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Hear me out. I'm hearing you out. This bloke owns a jazz bar and business was just doing shit. And so he's he's, he's, he's written this letter. He's not even the bloke doing the killings here. He's just spotted an opportunity to fill out his bar. I like it. And guess what? Every jazz bar in New Orleans has been filled out. Yeah. So he not only has he sorted himself out, but the whole city, the whole jazz scene is alive. Do you reckon on that night where everyone's going to jazz bars, all this kind of thing, do you reckon people are buying drinks or everyone just in the club <laughs> shaking, <laughs> like jazz dancing like that? No, I don't. It's, it's obvious that some uh, this person has some sort of attachment to the jazz world, though. Yeah. That you, you don't just just choose this for a complete random reason. I think as well. It's also a massive show of power. He wants to be able to feel like he can control 
this entire area and be like, look, if I want you guys to go to the jazz bar, I'm going to make you guys go to and the jazz he bar. He believes he's something completely else as well. Like yeah. he says to be exact, 12.15 brackets, earthly time. Like you're not on earth, bro. Like, yeah. Well, the whole thing is in here. He's saying he is not like a person. He's a, mm -hmm. he's a spirit. At that point, I think we can safely say this guy is mentally ill at, at some, to some extent. Mm -hmm. But also the, the, the thing with this note is there's no actual evidence that proves that this is actually the guy doing this. So it could have just been someone that's heard about this stuff, knows about the like the, the, the axe man, mm. and just goes, okay, this is an opportunity for me to fill out my jazz bar. I mean, whoever wrote that letter though, it's done a pretty good job of making it seem legit because that sounds like it's coming from a crazy person. Yeah, yeah, I know you're right. You're, you're right. absolutely right. Yeah, I. it's just a little bit annoying that there's not even anything in there that maybe only the person that committed the attacks would know so they could almost prove, hey, this yeah. is actually me, yeah. don't fuck with me. Yeah, sure. But maybe that didn't even cross the person's mind because it, it, honestly, this, this letter is very deranged. Steve Boker was the first to be attacked after the letter was published. Steve was attacked whilst he slept. During the night, he woke up to see a figure hanging over him and passed out. When he awoke, he ran to the streets to see what had happened and realized his head was cracked open. He ran to a neighbor's house and collapsed. He recovered, but couldn't remember much. Sarah Lawman lived alone and was found by her neighbors. She had a head injury and missing teeth. Her axe was found on the front lawn. She, like Steve, recovered, but couldn't remember much. Mike Pepitone was struck on his head and his wife arrived just as the axe man was leaving. None of the Pepitones could describe the axe murderer. However, it is believed that the murderer could have been the work of the mafia as Mike's father had previously killed another man in the past. Criminologists Colin and Dan Wilson concluded that the murderer chose to kill females and only murdered the man if he got in the way. Many also concluded that he was a jazz fanatic or played in the jazz industry and was wanting to get more people to listen to jazz. Interestingly, at the beginning, we said this guy kind of sucks at killing people in That's a way. True. You know, he's That's attacking, true. but a lot of these people were surviving. And now we're finding out that he was actually just trying to attack the women. Like, sorry, kill the women. And it's like the men were getting in the way of it. Mm. And so they would just almost be like, um, they would fall victim on the side of things. He wasn't their main target. You know, is this somebody that struggled to find like love, you know, find like, or just had a real hatred for women that were in relationships or close to partners? Was he jealous of that? When, when people just purely attack women, a lot of the time it is for those like self-hating reasons. Mm. Uh, and then obviously for the man just to get in the way. And they, and they keep recovering. Like I'm thinking another thing, maybe he's not killing them because he wants them to survive and tell the story. Yeah. That's a potential thing. Or for them just yeah. to feel like pain, like death is, uh, people say like it's, it's a quick way out. Mm. So he wants them to suffer, which is yeah. sadistic, even more sadistic. But yes, yeah, possibly I, I, I don't on the know. cards. But yeah. All right, well, let, let's look at a few of the suspects that we've got now. Straight after the murders of Louis and Harriet, the police arrested Louis Ubicon. He was a 41-year-old African-American man, and he was only employed a week prior by Louis. There was no evidence to prove that Louis was culpable, and yet the police were adamant to arrest him. Their only basis was that Louis kept changing his statement as to where he was early in the morning of the murder. Harriet woke up in the hospital and told the police that she was attacked by a mixed-race man. But the police didn't take this into account, as she was stressed and under duress. However, the police ended up having very little on Lewis, and so he was subsequently released. Lewis, Lewis, Lewis. What do you reckon, Chip? What do you think? Is this, is this guy our guy? What, what I find- He kept changing his statement. That, that is a little bit dodgy, you know, when people change their statement, it's like, why, why, why are you doing that? But you know, it's not, it's not enough, is it really? My thing is, we've got all these people here but we don't have him, like he's not connected to anything else. It's like, if you want to try and nail one. this guy, yeah. you have to have not only evidence for this one case between Louis and Harriet, mm -hmm. you also have to have, okay, so it also makes sense that he did this attack and this attack, and we just have none of that. And there really is just no evidence. We're, we're, it's literally just vibes. Yeah, it's just, what, it's it. just one couple. She said she saw a mixed race man. He's African American. That is literally the only connection that they can even tie. Yeah, to. and even then, that's such a it's so loose. Yeah, let's keep going. 
After the attack on Anna Schneider, James Gleason was immediately arrested as he was an ex-convict. He told the police that the only reason as to why he ran away from them was because he was arrested so many times and didn't want to be arrested anymore. But he was later released due to a lack of evidence. Alright, let's be honest. This bro is fed up on being arrested. Tired, man. Tired he's of the feds. Tired of the police. He's obviously, I reckon he was probably up to something no good. I just don't think that this is enough evidence to say, right, okay, he's a killer. Literally, he was just running away from the police. I, I can imagine back then, even to this day, people will just run away from the police. Uh, James Gleason, you are not my prime suspect. No way. Joseph Monfrey was shot by the fiancé of the Axeman's last victim, Mike Pepitone, on December 1920. He was also in prison between 1912 and 1918, and these dates coincide with the previous killings which stopped in 1911. Although this is a theory supported by many, Michael Newton, who is a true crime writer, couldn't find any evidence in public records of anyone called Joseph Monfrey being assaulted or killed. He also couldn't find any information on the fiancé or her arrest for such a crime. He also said that the name Monfrey was quite common at the time, and there was an individual named Joseph Monfrey who had organized crime connections. But there is nothing more extensive which could confirm this theory. This Joseph Monfrey also apparently led a blackmailing gang whose main target were Italians. A literary scholar, Richard Warner, claimed the chief suspect as Frank Doc Monfrey, whose alias was Leon Joseph Monfrey. Could this really just be a case? of Miss Peppertoni getting the names mixed up. I'm gonna be honest, it, it is really hard to follow because Mon Monfrey and Monfrey, they sound so similar, right? And you can easily imagine anybody could get those mixed up. Even when you're saying them, they don't sound, like they sound almost identical. Yeah, it's literally one letter. It's the difference yeah. between the two people. So this isn't, this isn't completely out there. Like this is possible, but again, it only links really, I mean, they found that he was blackmailing other Italians, but blackmailing and then just going and like killing and assaulting mm. people. I think that's like quite a difference. And a lot of them had like grocery stores. Was it something to do with that? Was there like a monopoly there? I don't really know. Um, but they said as well, their chief suspect was Frank Doc M Mumfrey, sorry. Yeah. And his alias was Leon Joseph yeah. Mumfrey. Yeah, so there's just a lot of names here and it just wouldn't have surprised me at all if, if, if something had gone terribly wrong and there was a mix up and you'd be fucking She's, human. You yeah, so she, the, the fiance has killed the wrong person <laughs> yeah. thinking this is the man. And it's they just it, some yeah. guy that has a similar name. But again, there's just not really that much evidence that actually like links them to the murders okay no. so you could say he was blackmailing but is there any is there any evidence other than that not, not really no let's keep going let's talk about the mafia some people believe that these killings were the mafia's doings they believe that it had to do with unpaid debts but many disagree with these theories as many of the victims were left alive something which the mafia wouldn't do i actually think that they say the mafia would have just killed them Maybe right? they're trying to send a sign though. But they, yeah, this is what I'm saying. Maybe they were trying to make a point. They're like, look, we're gonna half hurt you. We're gonna come after the women in your life. Yeah. Right? And if you keep messing it up, we're, we're, you'll be next. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, it, the mafia are a bit fucked like that. And he had, they had the whole city scared. So yeah. if it was the mafia, you know, they had people on lock. They had people under control. Yeah, and, and I actually, I, I actually quite, like the idea that it was the mafia just because i think yeah that maybe these people did odette or in their grocery store they were supposed to pay like a like a monthly fee to the mafia because that's what they do they come around and they say pay me my money and we'll yep. protect you type thing yeah and maybe they didn't and they were in debt to the mafia and they said okay so we're gonna hurt the people closest to you mm. right and send this these are warning shots start paying your debt otherwise it's you next that type of thing so I actually, so far, I actually think the Mafia one's the strongest. But again, there's no, nobody, you know, no one has been arrested for this. So there's no way you can know whether they were part of the Mafia or not. Let's keep going. Some people believe that the Axeman was supernatural. He had the ability to enter people's houses very easily and get away just as easily. Look, some people thought this guy was supernatural. Hey, look, we love aliens and UFOs. I'm just not too sure I'm down with this yeah. supernatural. Back in the day, you know, they believe in, they believe in everything. And everything. Look, write this one off. Let's go. 
Others believe that the murders could have been works of copycat serial killers, but many disregard this. The copycat killers. The only thing that makes me think that this could be a copycat serial killer case is because we have yet to have a suspect that works across two different like sets of victims. Mm. There's, there's not one where you've gone, okay, he was here when uh, this victim said it was uh, this person, and then this victim also said it was that person, meaning that it could have been a bunch of different it, people it doing really, the same thing. Yeah, it really could have been. So but, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe it was. But that, but that is also just a, a, a weird, like, I, in my head, like copycat serial killers, you might get one copycat, but in order for what I'm saying to be correct, you would have to have, you know, like six other copycats. Yeah, it might not even be a copycat. It just genuinely could be like maybe a small group. Maybe, maybe the mafia, two, mate. Two X-Men, three. The mafia. All the mafia, full on. That's what I'm saying. So maybe this was, a, you know, different people involved in the mafia and they're all told, hey, the way we're going to send out this message that it's the mafia doing it is by using the same weapon. And, and that will be, I think, that's how people will know that this person yeah. didn't pay their debt. If it was the mafia though, wouldn't, the, and the mafia were doing it, I feel like they'd want it a bit more clear cut that it was them. Like they've not really sent I mean, out a got, signal or yeah. anything that like, guys, just to let you know, they probably want New Orleans to know, oh, this is the mafia. So they know. To or how about when the people are saying, oh, I can't remember what it was is because the mafia, per the president walks up saying, you say a word, your whole family's dead. That that's potentially on the. And oh. so they're going, oh, I'm, I've, I was injured and I can't, I, I can't think about what this person looked like or whatever. Good plot for a movie, this. Seriously, look guys, thank you very much. Let us know down below, what do you think about the Axemen of New Orleans? Of course, if you guys did enjoy this video, what do they do? Make sure to subscribe and leave a like. You can listen to The Fellas Mysteries on Spotify as well. So go follow us over there and we'll be back next Monday with another mystery.